sing, let's stand from Romans 5, 1 through 2. Now that we have been made right with God by putting our trust in him, we have peace with him. It is because of what our Lord Jesus Christ did for us. By putting our trust in God, he has given us loving favor and has received us. We are happy for the hope we have sh of sharing the shining greatness of God. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for this day, Lord. We ask that you would be with us and help us, Lord, to open up our hearts and our minds to what you specifically want each one of us to hear today. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. All hail the power of Jesus' name.
Father, we thank you for your presence here with us this day. I pray, God, that we would be able to set aside all, <coughs> all of the busyness of our day, that we might hear your word to us. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. You may be seated. Good morning, good morning. So good to have you here in the Lord's house. Good to have you watching and uh, participating with us online this morning. We appreciate that. Uh, let's take up our Dime a Day missions offering at this time. If the kids would like to go to the back and get their containers, all the monies that are received to go to support our missions in Honduras. way of announcement, I just want to remind you that we do have an offering plate at the back. You can also use the GiveLify app on your smartphone or the GiveLify website or the bank. Your own personal bank can help you out and write a check to the church using the bill pay service that you have available there. All good ways of getting your tithes and offerings to the church. A couple of three things happening. First of all, this week has kind of been under the radar for most of you. But the end of this week is the Leadership Summit in Denver, Colorado. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, it's the time of the year that uh, your pastor and your delegate go to uh, conference. It's really not annual conference anymore. They call it Leadership Summit. And there's a very little annual conference business that we do. Most of it has already taken place with a, a vote online. But this year, it is in Denver. We leave Thursday. We'll be back Friday. Saturday, and instead of your delegate going this year, Kevin has just got so much work going on in too many houses. Oh my goodness! And me, we'll be traveling to <laughs> together, <laughs> and it should be a fun trip as we we fly to Denver Thursday and uh, enjoy the time together. It's going to be great. And then later in the month, we'll be. Kids Camp, Kids Camp coming up June 26, uh, Kids Camp June 26, and going through the next Wednesday, and then uh, Vacation Bible School on into July, and the dates of that have been shown on the screen, and you should have those, and they're on the 
board outside if you want to make sure you get those. So Vacation Bible School is going to be monumental. Well, that's the, the theme. That's the title, monumental. So, so it will be monumental. Uh, so that's the Vacation Bible School for this year. Did you have Junior Church prepared for today? Okay. Uh, kids are dismissed to go to Junior Church at this time. Well, we are in the uh, book of Acts, so take your Bibles, take your phones, turn to your favorite Bible app, and look up and find Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. If you've been with us the last two weeks, you will know that uh, this is the third sermon out of Acts chapter 2. And that's because, and then uh, it's a manifestation that's going to to happen to every believer from that point on. So everyone who comes to Christ receives the Holy Spirit. Jesus comes and lives in your heart, the way we, we, we talk about it to our children. So it's the power of the Holy Spirit. The second part is the truth of the Word. And this was the sermon of Peter. And the, the very heart of his sermon is Christ crucified. Christ was Alive, he died, he arose from the dead, and he did all of that to save us from our sins. And that's the crux of the truth of the word. And then this morning, we're going to look at the practice of the church. The practice of the church. And remember I said that we need, every believer needs all three of these in their life. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the truth of the word. And we need the practice or the love of the church, the fellowship of the church. And to whatever aspect one of those three may be missing in one's life, you're missing out on the fullness of what God has planned for you. So that's very important to see. So this message is about the practice of the church. I think it's no, uh, no secret that Christianity is declining in America, but it is growing exponentially globally. Places like China, Korea, Africa, Latin America, India, all these places have, who only had a few evangelical Christians a couple of hundred years ago now have millions. A revival is happening everywhere, so it seems, except for in Europe and in the United States. In England, by the way, four times as many people will be attending a mosque on Saturday night that will be attending church on Sunday morning. Wow. Now, do we blame the media or do we look in the mirror? Ouch. Yeah, it's going to be one of those sermons. I'm sorry. You see, I believe the church of the day, the church of today, not particularly this church, although take the truth where you hear it, but the church of today has lost the attitudes and the values of the early church. And that's what we are addressing today. We can't copy the early church's methods in 2022, but we can copy their attitudes, their values, their devotion, and their commitment. So what are the attitudes of the early church, and how do they compare to the church of today? There's five that I want to pay attention to. Five attitudes versus five attitudes, five attitudes of the early church versus five attitudes of the church of today. First one is the attitude of devotion. Devotion. And I guess we should read the scripture before we go any further. So we're looking at Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And I'll read the entire passage and then we'll come back and look at it. Acts 2, 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and, everything, and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. 
Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the, fellowship, the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. First attitude out of verse 42, devotion. They were devoted as opposed to the church of the day, which seems to be emotion or emotional. Devotion versus emotion. These early church people were devoted. Think about it. Many of them who were baptized on that first day, those 3,000 that were baptized on that first day, were doing it in full view of the political leaders who just seven weeks earlier had crucified Christ. Put in that perspective, seven weeks earlier, Jesus had been crucified by the same people who were now watching them be baptized in the name of Jesus. Don't you think that speaks to their devotion? Already, just right off the bat, devotion. It makes sense that they were devoted at this point. They were not just simply walking forward in these church services and simply saying the sinner's prayer and then forgetting about it. They were devoted. The word that we use for devoted in Greek means to give steadfast attention to, to hold on to and not let go, regardless of how scary it might be. Devoted means to follow regardless of the cost or the price. They were not in this for the thrills. They weren't in, in it for the thrills, for the emotion. They were in it because they were devoted seems today that many of the church of today has a, if it feels good, do it mentality, which is the attitude of our culture, right? I don't feel like going to church today, so I don't think I will. I don't feel like witnessing. I don't feel like serving today. I don't feel like, t I don't feel like tithing. I don't feel like loving. I don't, And if we're not careful, we'll bow down to the God of emotion because we don't feel like it instead of to being devoted to God. And we wonder why we don't see revival, why the church today does not see revival in America. You see, our devotion determines our destiny. You know, you can only be devoted to two or three things. In fact, your devotion plus uh, puts you in motion towards your destiny. It really does. Remember the words of the great theologian Bob Dylan? Who said, you may be an ambassador to France or to England. You may learn, like to gamble. You may like to dance. You may be the heavyweight champion of the world. You may be a socialite with a string of pearls. But you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Bob Dylan wrote those words. It's true. We're going to serve. We're going to serve somebody. Is Jesus Christ and his church a hobby or a passion in our lives? James Dennison says, in our culture, God is a hobby. God is for Sunday, not Monday. Just like go golf or tennis or any other hobby, God is a part of our lives, but not the Lord of our lives. We're consumers in our culture, so we go to church for what we get out of it. We judge the experience by what it means to us. It's for Sunday, not Monday. We separate the spiritual from the secular and religion from the real world, where people are making God, their king, they're joining the fifth great awakening, he, decide, he declares. Where they're making God their hobby, they're missing what God is doing in the nations. So is God your hobby or is he your passion? Is he just for Sunday or is he for every day of the week? Devotion, 
attitude, number one, in the church. Second attitude in the church, uh, in the early church, was tribal. Tribal versus individualistic. Verse 42b says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Fellowship. They were all fellows. Now, that doesn't mean that have any term have, have anything to do with gender. It has to do with academics. They were all fellows. They were all students of Christ, and they were all in the same tribe, the same ship, fellowship. <laughs> and the ship was that of Jesus. They were all in this together. All in this together. Think about this. Together. Together. Notice what it says. How many times it says together. They, the, how they continued to meet together. All the believers were what? Together. They broke bread in their homes and ate. How? Together. It was not an individualistic approach to Christianity like it seems to be in some of our churches today. You just say the simple prayer, the sinner's prayer, and that's it. You're, it's all about you and God. It's you between you and God. And yet Jesus taught us that when we pray, we pray our Father who art in heaven. Right from the onset of our prayers, understand that we are in this together. The early church met together. The Bible says in the temple courts, but they also met in their homes. Courts and homes, big and small. The temple courts would accommodate the large uh, meetings, uh, the large gatherings for teaching and for prayer. And then they would get personal and they would meet together in their homes. And then they would eat together and they would participate in the, in the Lord's Last Supper again in their homes. They would do things together. They lived together. You see that? So many times people in our culture, in our day and time, are falling apart because we're trying to do life alone instead of together. We don't seem to get this. Fellowship in the Greek word is kononia. But we have, but it's to share. This fellowship is the idea of sharing together. We have ride share. We have time share. Why don't we understand this Christ share? We share in the church and Christ together. We're not called to be spectators, but participants together. We all belong to this one big tribe, Christians. Then we all belong to this smaller tribe, Rockwall Free Methodist Church. And then we should belong to even smaller tribes, Bible study groups, uh, Sunday school classes, prayer groups. And because of the pandemic, we have allowed some of those just kind of to fade away. Maybe it's time to get some of those to come back together so that we again begin to live life together. Tribal. Third, attitude is that of expectancy versus complain, com, um, complacency. Expectancy versus complacency. Verse, uh, again, 32b. Uh, They were breaking bread and they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And then verse 30 through, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs. And then all the way down into verse 47, they were praising God. Now let me explain to you what this breaking to bread together was, right? They would share a common meal together and then they would actually repeat what Jesus had taught them as they served communion in their homes, the bread and the cup. And they would expect... Jesus to show up as they did this. They expected that. They expected when they went to prayer that Jesus was listening. They expected the Spirit to be with them and to be 
comforting them and to offering them the fellowship of God. They were expecting this. They were expectant. They were devoted to this kind of expectancy and worship. They remembered the words of Jesus when he said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am with them in their midst, right? So they actually expected God to show up. Do we expect God to show up when we come to church or when we view a church service? Or do we go with the attitude, oh, I hope the show's good today. Hope the song, I like the songs we sing today. I hope I'm uh, entertained today. Maybe even, oh, I hope I learned something out of the Bible today. And you leave from here and you go, I learned something out of the Bible today. Do we leave church saying, did I encounter Jesus today? Did I embrace his spirit today? Did I feel his presence in church today? Oftentimes, I'm afraid we come to church and we expect the routine, not the radical. We expect the common, not the uncommon. We expect the natural, not the supernatural, the emotional, not the miracles. If we don't expect them, we may miss them. I don't know. I don't know why I think of this. Every time I talk about this expectancy of the church... I see that little scene, that one small little scene from The Incredibles where the little guy's on the bicycle on the, on the sidewalk, right? And, he, and he, the, Mr. Incredible closes his car door and, and the shatters the window or, window or whatever, and he looks at the kid and says, what are you looking at? What are you expecting? I don't know. Something great, I guess. Something incredible, I guess. Are we expectant? See, where Christ finds faith, his power is present. The fastest growing Christian movements are those are movements that emphasize the immediate presence and power of the Holy Spirit, and they are expectant groups. They are expecting God to show up and to move among them. In other words, the churches that are growing are those that are expecting the Holy Spirit to be present and to fill them and to move them forward in ministry. Third attitude is that of sacrificial. Sacrificial instead of selfish. Verse 45, the early church was marked with this extraordinary spirit of generosity. They were, they were open-handed. These first Christians, remember, they were all Jews. Now, why do I say that? Because as Jews, they are already been tithing. They are already in the practice of tithing. So when it says that they were giving of their, uh, giving their gifts, it's over and above the tithe. They were already worshiping one way. Now they are worshiping over and above that in a generous way. It says that they were selling property. They were selling their positions, their possessions. I can imagine it's just one of the greatest yard sales ever. The first yard sale. They're on the temple court. They all bring it together and they're selling it. And the proceeds go to help those that are in need. Now this wasn't communism as some have imagined. And I can give you three reasons why. First of all, it was voluntary, not mandatory. It was a, not an even distribution of the goods that was brought in. It was distributed according to the seriousness of the need. And it was a temporary thing that they were doing not permanently or it was something that was not long-lived, although the spirit of it was long-lived and the practice of it, uh, uh, but there, the practice was not, but the spirit was. So what's going on? These spirit-filled people saw that there was a need among them, and so they sacrificed what they had to help out their neighbors. One scholar says, what we do or don't do with our material possessions is an indication of the Spirit's 
presence. Evangelical Christians, as according to the, uh, the Barna reports, evangelical Christians give an average of 2.5% of their income to the cause of Jesus Christ. 2.5% of their income. Only 17% of evangelical Christians claim that they do tithe. And of that group, only a, a follow-up study showed that only 6% of that 17% actually did. And you may think that the more wealthy a person is, the larger they give their money. Studies have shown that the, the more wealthy someone is, the less likely they are to give to the work of Christ. Or the percentage doesn't go up is what it amounts to. So the question is, are our homes and our possessions, our finances surrendered to Christ and to his mission? Are we sacrificial? Or are we selfish in what we have? Remember, it's all given to us. It, it, it's all God's. It's all God's in the first place. And then the fifth point is that of missional. Missional versus myopic. Myopic, what's that? Self-focused, narrow-minded. Uh, I've heard it termed as navel-gazing. You know, if you, realize, if, if you look at your navel, you're, you're not looking up and about. You're focused on yourself. Are we missional or are we myopic? Verse 47. Verse 47. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people and the Lord added to their number daily, daily those that were being saved. This means that the ones that were not being... Uh, It, this means that the ones that were not being saved had a good opinion about the church. Now, the political lever, leaders, they may not have had a good uh, view of the church, but those that were not, j just the, the, the community itself would look at the Christians and go, that's a cool group of people. Look what they're doing. Look how they're living. Look what they're, they're, how much they love each other. Oh, they will know that we are Christians by our love. That's what Jesus said. Missional. In the church today, service means what we're doing right here. We're having a service. But in the early church, service meant that we serve others serve those outside the church we let them know about jesus we're on mission we're following jesus with purpose and passion not i'm on a mission for god we're on a mission with god on a mission with god and so that is what it comes down to so as we look at these Again, devoted, tribal, expectant, sacrificial, missional. I have to ask myself, how am I doing? How am I doing with these attitudes in my life? And working them within my church, our church, our community, the church of today. And what can I do? To be a light and to make a difference, not just in the world, but in the church of today. You do realize that we have been made to worship. We have been made to honor God, to worship Him. And the whole story of the Bible is God taking the initiative to bring us back to Him so that we can fulfill the purpose for which we were made, and that is to honor Him, to love Him, and to worship Him, and to love others and to serve others through the power that He infills us with. Amen? Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, as we think in terms of being made to worship, I just pray, God, that you would indeed empower us, guide us, 
lead us. That we might see these attitudes of the early church and, and see where we fall short, where I fall short. And, and Lord, where I need to be more devoted, more dedicated, more passionate to follow you. So God, I pray that we would indeed worship you and honor you in all that we are and all that we say. In the name of Jesus, amen. place we ask your blessing lord we ask your blessing to be upon us we ask the fresh indwelling of your holy spirit would be with us and lord that we would not just expect your presence here but that we would expect your presence everywhere because you are with us you are empowering us through your holy spirit you have given us the truth of your word and you have made available to us this uh, uh, idea of worship and fellowship and love within the body of believers. We praise you. We give you the glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you.